So I've had the talk with my son at a very, a pretty young age. I think probably before I should have had to have that talk, but I had to have that. The way the world was going, like just for his safety as his father, I needed to sit down with him and explain some of my, what I've gone through and some of what he may face. And if he does get into that situation, here's how you handle it. As a black teenager, here's how you handle it. Here's what you don't do. Here's what you do. Here's where you put your hands. Here's who you talk to. Here is who you don't talk to. You say, yes, sir. You say, no, sir. You do. If you reach for something, you warn people. Here's how you de-escalate a situation. There's all these things he has to think of as a black teenager. And as you know, that I have to think of in this and in my daughter as well, um, that if you're not a, a person of color, it just it may seem like, well, why do you have to do all of that? Hello and welcome to The Ally Show. My name is Elias Lamerfar and I'm your host for the show. We are in our episode number six. In this episode, we are chatting with Bakari Holmes. Bakari and I, we met a few years ago back when both of us used to work at Course Hero, an education technology company in the Bay Area. A little bit more about Bakari. He is an award-winning musician, educator, and technical leader with a passion for DEI and mental health. You can find his music on Bandcamp at bakarisoul.bandcamp.com and all streaming platforms on their Bakari. For easier access, we added all of his links to our show notes. In this episode, we are talking about a wide range of uh, stories and important conversations, all the way from his story uh, that caused uh, the PTSD that he's going to be talking about, and then we also talked about his challenges dealing with depression, anxiety, and how he's actually dealing with all of those today. He's also like sharing a lot of very interesting and important tools from his toolkit over the past many years that he has been dealing with depression and anxiety. We also talk about specific important resources from NAMI. We put all those links for you in the show notes. I highly recommend to educate yourself and others about these very important resources, hotlines, and warm lines from NAMI and other organizations. Also, in general, if you're suffering from any mental health issues, please make sure to contact your mental health or medical experts. In this episode, as mentioned earlier, we are talking about depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and also racial profiling and racist behaviors. If this is a sensitive topic to you, please skip this episode, and hopefully we can catch you in the next episode of The Ally Show. The accountability campaign for this episode is about doing a specific kind of breathing for 30 days, which is called box breathing. Bakari is telling us more about it in the end of the show, so please stay tuned and join to that campaign if that's something that you would like to be participating. The link to join to that campaign is also in our show notes. I hope you have been enjoying the Ally Show so far. If you like our show, please subscribe on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And as you know, you can give us a review up to a five star. That would help the show to be seen by those who are in the need of hearing these conversations. Now, without further ado, let's start our conversation with Bakari Holmes. We are here with Bakari Holmes, and I'm so happy that we reconnected after a few years that uh, we met each other back at Course Hero. Well, first of all, thank you for coming on the show, and I would love to have everyone actually get to know you a little bit better. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Is there fake applause? <laughs> In case there's not. Um, yes, my name is Bakari Holmes. I am a goofball. And uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, so first of all, we met at Course Hero. Um, you know, I have a, a background as an educator. Um, I, I taught STEM uh, for about 12 years, in high school and middle school. I taught music. And then I um, 
taught uh, physics and astronomy and engineering. I actually started an engineering program in Palo Alto. Um, very unique uh, engineering program that almost cost me my soul as well. So um, that's the whole, whole, I guess, another story we can delve into. But um, yeah, during that time, I realized I was an engineer. I realized that tinkering with things, that uh, that was the way to go for me. Um, and design, I was really interested in design. And I have this, I've always had this artistic side. So I actually went back to school, uh, a school that kind of encouraged you to develop both of those. It's called University of Silicon Valley. At the time, it was called Cogswell. And uh, I became a software engineer, uh, worked at a gaming company. I worked at multiple different kinds of companies, met lots of different people. Um, Ali was one of those. And um, at Course Hero, I was trying to combine my love for uh, education and education training in helping students um, and learners uh, reach their full potential, as well as building great software, working on software teams, building, building great products. So that's where we intersected. We would have lots of lunchtime meetings. And I don't know, maybe we I would say hi, and maybe we would try to start going in a work direction, but it never... <laughs> <laughs> it never did because I always felt like you are also a pretty deep guy and like you're a person that I could have these kind of conversation with, you know, about family, about kids, about all kinds of stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I was just happy to reconnect with you recently and, you know, restart, not restart, but let's like rekindle, I guess. The, the importance of launch conversations which honestly, like right now, being out of uh, work environments for a few months, maybe the one thing, and of course, being remote for three plus years since COVID, mm. the biggest thing I miss about work is having those real conversations. As a matter of fact, now I just noticed maybe that's why I'm podcasting and talking to people because I miss those kind of like deeper, genuine, true conversations. Of course, when it's about work, you're talking about work and it's a project that comes in a day and goes by the day after. But what mattered to me, at least back then, was these real conversations that I'm missing them. So I'm glad I have it again. It's also like good for me yes. that I'm having it with my former coworkers that I had definitely, those conversations definitely. with. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of like a comfort zone. Now I'm realizing it. I just had a moment of realization. What do you have? What do you have to say about that? I think I think that's what you said is is really important, and a good jumping off point is someone that you already have a rapport with, whether it's maybe not that deep, and then but you you have a rapport, but you kind of know that, hey, I can go uh, a little bit deeper, or you know maybe I know some things, but I don't know everything. Uh, so I, I think that's important. I, it's because in in work I kind of alluded to this before. I am very, very ambitious, and my wife will attest to this. My kids will attest to this. And sometimes I get lost in my ambition, and I'm driving, 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 driving for this, you know, quote unquote, noble goal. But I lose my humanity, not my humanity. I don't become a monster, but like I become just, um, I lose sight of my values, like why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going for the goal, but I'm, not necessarily tuned into myself mentally or uh, emotionally or to the people around me that are the most important, which is my wife and my children. And yes, I am married and I have children. Probably figured that out from what I said. But I think I think that's important. Those those conversations are part of, you know, us being human and us reaching out to humans around us and being human. And, you know, it's not just about the bottom line. It's not just about what we're here to do to make money. But it's about connecting across cultures. I think I, I remember discussing and asking you questions about your culture and be, really being curious because there are lots of gaps and lots of things that I didn't, didn't know, but that I want to know. And that's a, a curiosity that I have. And I think that's also important, especially today with all that's going on in the world, that we reach across and, you know, to our brother or sister or other person and you know, just care about them, just um, have compassion and 
have be genuinely interested in other people in their point of view, not just our own point of view. So I think like those lunchtime con- those lunchtime conversations are a great way to for a springboard for those kinds of um, for those kinds of conversations. They they can go south. I've I've had some that have gone south. <laughs> I think like sometimes like being in the silo of like solving problems for from a business perspective, we forget about the fact that like even for our users and our customers, we should also like be genuinely curious. Uh, what's their problem? How might we be able to help mm-hmm. them? What background causes this need? Uh, and I think the best way to practice it is by being genuinely curious and interested into knowing the people you have around you. That's for free. That's the one you don't need to hire on a social media that, hey, come join me for this effort or come to participate in this research. No, you have those people around you to be genuinely curious about them. And uh, to give a little plug uh, to my current company, Competes TV, which uh, very soon... Something may be happening. I'll just mm-hmm. say that much. But I um, have. I'm a. I'm now a manager, and one of one of my big focuses is UX, is user experience. So you know, we were talking about the human element of building a product, and in UX, you like can't ignore what your users are experiencing. Sometimes it's frustration. Sometimes it's anger. They're mad at your, at your product because they didn't want to do X, Y, and Z, but you know they they have a blocker, and sometimes you don't know what that blocker is. You don't know if it's a bug. You don't know if it's a feature. If it's something that you built uh, intentionally a certain way, you don't know. Maybe if your user flow, you 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 they are able to actually do it, but the way that your user flow uh, progresses, um, it's it's just too many steps and it's just too much fatigue. So I think, again, being in tune with yourself, your own emotion, and your own spirituality, if that's, that's what you want to call it, if that's what you, who you are, that's who I am, um, and then with that with others, that uh, is just a reminder and also is a good sharpening tool, even business-wise. This is the purpose behind doing and having these conversations, like... We are not Hmm. just genuinely curious to know someone, to be friends with them, to work with them, but we are genuinely curious about them to see what from their stories can actually be helpful for the rest of us. Like it's not, it's it's like, it's like that position. Like sometimes we are curious because we are expecting to have an answer, but sometimes I think. Uh, in these sort of conversations, I started actually developing this for myself. So maybe maybe other folks who are tuning in, they feel the same way. I started actually like thinking about how to question myself rather than how to ha- have an answer. Like I think th- it's, it's a very fine line between like thinking that I'm looking for an answer to something. Let's go and talk to people. These days, I'm looking for questions, like oh, okay. how to yeah. come up with better questions, knowing other backgrounds, knowing other cultures, knowing why people are the way they are. That gives me like a new framework for having yeah. even questions. I don't know if, if that makes sense to you um, or if you want to add a, anything yeah, to that it. That makes a lot of sense. That curiosity... And being a musician, being, being an, uh, an artist is very like you're bearing your soul, but you're not just bearing your soul, hopefully, just to bear it, just for your own therapy. You're also trying to give um, an experience that, other, that can pull others in or pull others out of where they are and give them this experience that helps them or that gives them an, a release. Uh, that's why I do music, that emotional reaction that people have when I, when I write something. I just re- recently, I actually haven't released it, but I just recently submitted a song for Grey's Anatomy. This is kind of a sidebar, but it connects. This song is about me battling with depression. 
and it's called Depression Confession. And as you can see, it's kind of like the spirituality and, you know, the emotional health. Um, but as you get into the song and as you go through the song, hopefully it takes people on a ride and allows them to see that they're not alone and that they, um, they too can have their depression confession moment and see that it's okay to not be okay. The song, it begins with a question and it ends with a question. It does not resolve that question, but it just asks a bunch of different questions as you're going through the song. So it actually relates to what you were saying. It's, will I fly? Will I fall? Will I glide? Can I stand tall? Will I fly? Will I fall? Will, can I stand tall? I hear the preacher man say, it will get better. That's not what my thoughts tell me as I write these letters. I go left, try to go right. Sometimes I just can't reach that height. Will I fly? Can I fly? When I see my light, you're the thought I count on, can't outrun. Clouded by what can't be undone. Where will I run to? If my chance comes, will I know what to do? Will I fly? Will I fall? Will I glide? Will I stand tall? Will I fly? Will I fall? Can I stand tall? Can I fly away to be what I see when I dream? Is what I have inside even good enough? Can I fly? Will I fly? And then the very end just repeats the chorus, which is, will I fly? Will I fall? Will I glide? Can I stand tall? Will I fly? Will I fall? Can I stand tall? And then can I fly? It ends on that question. Wow. So um, I guess I'm kind of like uh, towing the line because I'm not singing the song. And in case it does get accepted by Grey's Anatomy, Grey's Anatomy people, please pick, pick my song. I think it would be great in a melancholy sequence, um, but yeah, it's not it's not released, and I'm planning on releasing it in 2024. So, um, so you cannot sing it event something. for us a little bit. You don't. I'm <laughs> not going to be able to. I can sing something else. Okay, I can yeah, sing something else. But <laughs> by the way, that was that was well written. Like as someone who can uh, relate to parts of it. I can tell you it was so moving. So thank you for sharing that with us. And it would be amazing if you can sing for us right now a little. How do I say goodbye to what we had? The good times that made us laugh always come back yeah. I thought we'd get to see forever but forever is gone away it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday thank you i i remember seeing your linkedin post sometimes you were posting on linkedin post course hero time and i was mm-hmm. like this guy i never knew he can sing and the, the way you, you posted it and like the encouragements around it was so amazing where this started man like what's the story behind you singing if if you can share a brief version of it. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Voice is all cracking. Um, so I grew up in a, in a very large family um, on both sides, very musical. My dad uh, plays, plays, he's a master drummer and um, plays all kinds of percussion and trains others to do the same as well as the, kind of the spiritual and emotional uh, connection to their ancestors and to how that instrument 
um, has been used over the years in different cultures. So very rich cultural tradition on both sides. Um, on my on my mom's side, very uh, traditional kind of fundamentalist Christian uh, a cappella singing. Happy birthday happens, and then my aunties stand up. I have a lot of aunties. I can't even remember the number. I think it's I think it's nine and it was nine and or eight. Let me not let me not try to guess. I've got lots of aunties <laughs> and and uncles, all who either can sing or know how to jump onto a note. Because if if someone's singing "Happy Birthday," everybody's kind of looking around, you know. If you're not, uh, if you're not, if you're not jumping on your note, so it's like four part harmony uh, that I was hearing, you know, at a very young age, and you know, through church and you know, seeing with my cousins, um, just kind of developed my ear and a desire to always have this, you know, this camaraderie and this fun and this laughter and sometimes laughing to until we cry, but just about music. But we we, we bonded over. Lots of different kinds of music, not just church music, but hip hop and R and B, and then I got into jazz, and then I actually studied um, studied music at San Jose State. I was a music minor, and uh, then I got into music professionally and started performing as a solo jazz uh, artist, and you know recorded some things, and in the then the age of Spotify kind of came along. And I, I was involved with, with acapella still. So like I was doing, first it was like amateur collegiate acapella, like pitch perfect. And then um, like semi-pro acapella, then pro acapella, um, performing at fairs and, you know, weddings and different things like that. Um, and then doing like kind of the solo, uh, solo act thing for weddings and then performing with my groups. And now, I guess, where I've landed, having moved to Atlanta, is I'm actually building a recording studio here. So I'm in the process of doing that. I'm also writing for Sync, which is why I submitted for Grey's Anatomy. I'm part of uh, uh, this group called the the Sync Titans. You can look that up. Uh, Michael Elsner and Jody Friedman. Shout out to them. Um, and the group that they run, the community that they are, are building, um, and some, and just some of the great friends and musicians that I met through there. So I'm doing that. I'm also doing voiceover, um, where I can, I'm doing some background vocals and some worship, uh, some worship music. That's not as much as, as, as before, but it's okay. You know, I'm trying to, um, take it slow and, and adjust to, you know, our new reality being here. And being in a new house, being hup, being homeowners, and having, um, you know, a wealth that we can pass on through the generations, which is important, particularly in the African American community. One of the top challenges that I have with my mental health is anxiety, and um, it stems from multiple things. I I believe in the whole nature and nurture thing. So there were some, I'll just say I'm working through some trauma and, you know, healing from some trauma. And it had to do with some experiences that I had with um, Oakland Police Department, basically being innocent, being unarmed, being a black teenager and being a target. And uh, like someone, a figurative target, but also a literal target being um, you know, held at gunpoint you know, all the things that you see on the news, um, not all the things, but like a lot of things you see on the news like happening to me as a, as a young boy. And now I'm trying to reconcile that with who I am as a man and, you know, raising my, raising my children. Some of it also is genetic. Um, I do believe that, you know, I did work, did some work at 23 and me. Uh, I'm no longer there just to be clear. <laughs> So anything they're doing now or in the last few years, uh, you know, I haven't been I haven't been involved with. But Anne Anne is a great person. Uh, got nothing but love for her and her and her team. Um, I'm kind of rambling, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, anxiety is something that I battle with on a daily basis, and um, 
try to find ways to cope with um, in, you know, these different spheres that I walk in. And in some cases, these spheres that I'm walking in, they help. But in some cases, the anxiety is triggered because, you know, there's a responsibility or there's, you know, a conversation. A conversation can, um, can trigger something in me. And then I'm like, oh, wow, I'm feeling that, like I'm nine years old again. I'm feeling like I'm 10 years old again. And I'm like this little person. How do I work through this? So I'm going to answer my own question <laughs> that I just asked, if that's okay. Yeah. So, so some of the things that I do, um, I am a big believer in if, in, you know, y using our medical, uh, the system that we have of mental health. It's not perfect. I, t I am well aware that it's not perfect, but I think there are, if you can find them, there are some really caring skilled people that um, can really, really help you. Therapists, these are psychiatrists. In some cases, these are like social workers. Um, depending on where it is that you're at in life, um, these are people that can help help you connect the pieces. With I've found with my emotion, even if I'm a reflective person, I don't see everything. I don't you know, like even being married, my wife notices patterns that I didn't pick up on, but she's noticing these things, looking at me from the outside over time. And sometimes I invite her to my therapy session and that is helpful because it helps the therapist have a fuller picture of what's going on. Not that I'm trying to leave something out, but it's just like I'm blinded. I have blind spots. We all, I think we all have blind spots. And the relationships in our lives, as well as, you know, connect us to our humanity sometimes can also expose those blind spots so we can better be better versions of ourselves and deal with the things that we need to deal with, whatever those are, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's bipolar, um, you know, um, but yeah, so therapy, um, I actually do take medication. I take medication as it's been prescribed to me and I take it religiously, almost like it is my faith <laughs> because my, my ability to function the way that I want to depends on it. I'm not one of those people that can just be go, oh, you know, I just go off my meds, you know, for two, two months, three months and just, you know, see what happens. No, uh-uh. <laughs> Tried that, done that, doesn't work. Not for me. Uh, I'm not I'm not one of those people. It's just the way that the cards were dealt. I've cried over it. I have, you know, pleaded and begged. It is it is what it is right now. It may change, but right now this is where it is. So um, taking my medication. So those are like the bedrocks, the therapy, the medication. There are also other things like that you can do that are like uh, outpatient. So I went through an IOP program. Um, uh, what is it called? Intensive outpatient. So there's PHP, there's IOP. I think one is you go every day and you have these classes, you have ther uh, therapists there, you have caseworker, uh, you have a psychiatrist, you have uh, nurses. So you have the, it was right connected to the hospital. So it was actually really, really integrated. And you were there with other people that maybe had similar things or maybe they were different. And you had like the first floor that people that were basically flight risks. Um, they couldn't leave. I was on the second floor. Those are people that could come and go. And uh, it was very, very transformative for me. I went through the first time just to get my anxiety and my panic, just panic attacks under control. The second time I went through, um, I was more trying to understand some of the whys. And this is after like 20 years of therapy, something like that. Um, but I'm very committed to my, to my mental health. And there's so many tools out there. Um, some of the tools that I learned in that IOP program, breathing, 54321. 54321 is like, just quite really quickly. That's when you, um, you look around the room 
if you're in a situation where you're trying to gain control of your senses or gain control of your anxiety, uh, you find five things in the room that you can see or four things in the room that you can hear or three things in the room that you can touch. You can you can even touch them if you want. Um, you know, and then two, one, same thing. So it doesn't ma matter what those five or four or three are, but just making sure you're engaging your senses. Having like a, a cold press or like a, a, a orange that you keep, a uh, piece of fruit that you keep in the freezer. You can take that out, put, put it in your hands and you can breathe while you're doing that. What that does is it slows everything down. It helps you slow your breathing because sometimes it's like hard for me to, to catch my breath. But when I have that in my hand, it aids my body in slowing down and it allows me to, again, take control over, you know, my higher brain function. So um, those are just some of the things that I do. I also do box breathing. That's like I'm almost a meditative breathing, um, breathing in, counting to four, holding, counting to four, breathing out, counting to four holding, counting to four, and then you can repeat that. It doesn't have to be four. It could be seven and six or, you know, maybe you, when you breathe, maybe you have to have, if you have asthma, breathing in may be harder. So you might want to do a few that shorter. But the point is, is to have a rhythmic, um, mindful way of breathing that you're paying attention to your breath. You're paying attention to how long you're breathing. You're paying attention to, are you clenching up when you're breathing? And then if you see that you are, then, you know, releasing that tension. Mm. One of the things I also learned is how common panic disorder and depression are. Like one in four, one in five. I can't remember the exact number, but it's when I learned that I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm not alone. There's like people all over, all around me just walking around that, you know, we're all struggling with similar things. We're just not saying anything. First of all, we are not even able to recognize it sometimes that, oh, this is a problem. It's not normal. Second, it's like the stigma around it doesn't allow us to feel comfortable start mm -hmm. talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, well said. You, you, you mentioned a few things. I want to call out some bullet points. And if you wanted to... Uh, give more detail about some of them, feel free. If not, uh, we can jump to the other ones. I think the first one that comes to mind uh, is definitely like your story um, around what what happened with you with the Oakland police. If you want to go deeper in, in there, two is um, this anxiety. Like I think it's one of those things, as you mentioned, like a lot of us are dealing with it what's what's that for you what are the characteristics of that for you you also even Ooh, before that yeah you, let's... you know it, it, you mentioned like sometimes uh, actually uh, in uh, your therapy like your partner is also like helpful to give you some corner cases of your behavior uh earlier i wanted to ask you like how is your family helping you with catching those moments which you called out this sort of like mm. therapy experience to me that was interesting yeah. we kind of like went the full, full circle i kind of got my answer but if you can share a little bit about there and then lastly i just want to mention since you mentioned five four three two one uh emily our guests on episode two she actually opens her conversation with a meditation practice of five four three two one uh, so the, for those who are listening, that's a good episode to tune into. If you if you have never practiced that, she's taking us through that experience as well. So I'm gonna pause. I, I awesome. asked many questions. That's awesome. But... I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna check that episode out. So you said that's episode two. Episode Correct. Two. Okay. Episode two with All right. so, Emily uh, Shickley. Okay. Oh, did we used to work with her? Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> Emily. Like the Emily we used to work yeah, with. Yeah, Emily. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. Oh my God. Yeah. Again, full yeah. circle. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Um, okay, so I'll start with the. I guess one of the last things you said, which is how do my like my partner and my family? How does that factor into mental health? Well, it it's very interesting because 
I don't know if interesting is the right word, but all of us deal with some kind of mental health challenge in my family. And I'm not going to reveal any names or anything. Sorry. Again, I'm feeling mighty. Um, but yeah, so my, my wife, it's, it's kind of been late in the sense of she's now exploring like if some behaviors or some things, um, are because of something that maybe was not diagnosed or something that was missed. Um, and then my kids, from a young age, we spotted some things and we were like, we're not sure what this is, but, you know, like we sent my daughter to this play therapist and they were playing with dolls and it was just like, it was very creative. Uh, it was this, this doctor near Stanford in Palo Alto, but just a great doctor and was able to like, pinpoint some things in our daughter and my wife's relationship early on that, you know, that she started working on, that my wife started working on and was able to address. Um, but we have always, we used to have a chart um, and this is some parenting advice. This is a really great exercise, but we had two charts on our wall and one said, um, how are you feeling? And it had like 32 faces um, in rows and columns. Uh, and they were just like, you know, happy, sad, angry, embarrassed, guilty. It was just a whole bunch. So what we would do is we, we being me or my wife, or when we would have the kids, we say, okay, you know, I want you to go up to the, to the board and tell us, you know, point to one of those that describes how you're feeling. And so, you know, at first it was kind of hard, but after a while they started to get the hang of it. And, it was very interesting seeing my, my son, he was like, I'm mad. He was usually mad and sad. I think it was like mad and sad. He had two. And then my daughter would have like, I have this one and some of 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 this one. It's my brother's fault. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, uh, but it opened the door to having these conversations and, you know, this is kind of a building a safe space. And that's an important thing for us as parents is building that safe space. The other, the other, um, the other one that we had was, uh, why are you angry? And it had an angry face, but it had all arrows to these other emotions, these secondary emotions. So the idea is that you can feel angry, but sometimes there's, of something else under it. It's like, you feel angry. Why did, did your brother hit you? No. You know, did this happen? No. Did, did this happen? You know, you start crying because there's this other layer to, you know, your, your emotion to your anger. And so I think all of those things, emotion, your thoughts, spirituality, your mental health, those are all connected. I can't explain it. I'm not a PhD. I'm not God. I, I can't. I didn't invent the whole human body or the brain, but I think somehow they're all connected some way. And I think we had a sense of that. Um, and we were trying to tap into that in the way that we parented and not neglect emotion. Say, oh, sit down, just eat your peas. We did try that. It didn't work. So we <laughs> were like, this clearly is not working <laughs> for our family. Um in in terms of my mental health, um, I have definitely opened myself up just to receive input. It's something that I deep deeply believe in. It's not just going through life, but like paying attention to the inputs that are being sh shown to you about yourself. And then you know, if there's something that I need to change, then working on that. And so that could be my wife. That could be my, of course, my children. That could also be, you know, relatives, friends, you know, coworkers, um, being open to giving and receiving that that input. Um, there's lots of terms for it um, in different circles, but um, because that is my belief, when I went into therapy, I nat not I wouldn't say naturally. It was easier for me to get there. Because, you know, there were times I was, no, nah, I don't want to, uh -uh. no, it's my therapy. Don't want you there. 
And then um, yeah, I remember my wife was just like, hey, you know, I've got some concerns about bipolar and this is why. Boom, 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 boom. And I was like, OK, you know what? I'll just have you come. You can talk to the therapist. And I'm thinking, oh, the therapist is going to just, you know, shut it down. And uh, so she came, she talked and I talked to the therapist listening. The therapist goes, yeah, I do. I do think there's something to this. I think you could be bipolar. I'm like, what? <laughs> In my inside, I'm like, what? <laughs> but I'm trying to, you know, maintain my cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they started me on this one um, uh, medication for bipolar. And, man, my depression lifted within like two weeks. It was amazing. So that's, I guess, that that vignette or that story just illustrates how when you are tapped in to those different pillars of who we are, when you are open to uh, the inputs that life is trying to show you, whether, you know, you're spiritual and you believe in God or, you know, it's, it's uh, relationships in your life or you're just observant, you know, you're just emotionally observant. And if when it comes to mental health, as we're talking about on this episode, you know, you allow other people to encourage you, to help you, to reflect. No, I think this is the kind of person you are because I hang out with you every day and, you know, you think you don't, you know, amount to anything, but I don't think that's true. Like just allowing those voices into your life, I think will be, be better for it and healthier for it. And I think I'm a testament to that. Not only just the work that I've done, because I have done a lot of work, but the, the work that others have done in loving me. I wouldn't call it work, but just the care that they've shown in just being involved in my life and sticking with it. It tells me if you want it to work, first of all, it's possible. There, there is a setting that within some setting, you can yes. get some good results. Two, it requires commitment from others all people around it. We can't just expect, we can't just tell our friends, hey, Ali, like, you're not doing well, dude. Like, you've been so angry recently. We can't just say that without committing to help him solve that problem. Like, solving right. mental health problem, again, I think it's a terminology for this episode that we are keep using. It's a full circle of efforts. It's it's that, like, I think mm -hmm. everyone, everyone has to see their uh, part in that challenge. So with the Oakland Police Department, I mean, I won't go into more detail than I already have, but I will just say that there, ha <laughs> there have been events that have happened right in front of me or that I've seen on social media or that I've seen on the news that are almost identical to what I've gone through. So it's very, very hard for me to know about it or to see it and to not have it affect me, and to not have it trigger it's what they call post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Like if you, most people think about the military, right? If you are in the military and you are around a certain kind of lifestyle, and then you come out of that lifestyle, but then there is lingering stress and trauma because of the, uh, because of what you experience. It's the same for Sometimes kids that grew up in the inner city or the kids that grew up in a rough neighborhood or kids that just grow up. Um, for me, you know, I, I grew up in a upper middle class family, um, but it was very shocking to experience the thing that I did when I was like, you know, just passing out flyers, just you know, with my music group dressed up, you know, in whatever, our parachute pants and <laughs> high top fade. And, you know, we're trying to pick up girls and that's what we were thinking about. We weren't thinking about anything else. And so they, um, the excuse the police gave was that they, that we matched the description of someone that did a shooting. And so we were, of course, is racial profiling. And, uh, and then all of the things after that transpired very, very quickly within a matter of seconds. 
And it just it transformed my life. I mean, I'm still trying to put the pieces back together. And it's sad, but it's it's just it's just the reality of the world that we live in. And, you know, it affects my children. Um, because they know what I went through and they experience things themselves. Uh, so I've had the talk with my son at a very, a pretty young age. I think probably before I should have had to have that talk, but I had to have that because I felt that it, his safety with the world, the way the world was going, I just had, for his safety as his father, I needed to sit down with him and explain some of my what I've gone through and some of what he may face. And if he does get into that situation, here's how you handle it. As a black teenager, here's how you handle it. Here's what you don't do. Here's what you do. Here's where you put your hands. Here's who you talk to. Here is who you don't talk to. You say, yes, sir. You say, no, sir. You do. If you reach for something, you warn people. Here's how you de-escalate a situation. There's all these things he has to think of as a black teenager. And as you know, that I have to think of in these, and in my daughter as well, um, that if you're not a, a person of color, it just it may seem like, well, why do you have to do all of that? But it, I mean, it's just like it's tiring, like trying to explain that. But it's just that's just my life, and that's just the life that it's not all the time. You know, I don't walk around like that all the time. But there's just again moments that just rip you out of the comfort that you're in and put you into this situation where now you're it's survival and you're trying to survive and so i wanted to impart that to my son in that conversation i'm going to go anxiety 101 and i'll try to go advanced um but anxiety 101. So anxiety is a good thing. First of all, I'm going to start out by saying that anxiety is a good thing because we need it to survive. We need when there's danger. We need when there is we are there's a threat to our lives. You know, especially you know as we evolved as humans, there were different threats that when they showed up, we needed to we needed to flee, or we needed to stand and we needed to fight, or we needed to like scare the thing away, whatever it is, if it's a bear or something. That's called the fight or flight response. And that is actually built into our, to our, inst- we, this is our instincts. Uh, when we get into situations, we get into fight or flight. Now, there are certain situations that in your life, when you're going to go into fight or flight and you should. What happens when you have a disorder is your fight or flight response is triggered way too often. And I say too often. Well, what is too often? Well, I don't know. It's different for everybody. Some people they want to they want it to be triggered in certain situations, and some people some people they don't want it to be triggered in situations. For instance, if I'm giving an example, for I don't want to be triggered every time I see a cop and I drive by, and I'm not. You know, I think I think by and large most cops are good people. They get into it for the right reasons. I have two family members who. Or in law enforcement, uh, so I'm I'm not against like law enforcement. So I don't want to be triggered every time I see a cop. But then again, there are certain times when that flight or flight response is triggered, not because of something necessarily that they're doing, but because of my past, something that another cop did to me in another city or another place, or maybe I'm in the same city that I was where the, where it happened. That actually happened. We went to a concert. It was in the same block that where it happened, we were walking by and I was just like, oh my gosh, it was just, I started feeling, you know, my muscles tensing up, um, breathing much, much faster. It's like, almost like, hey, you know, a lion just came up and just growled at me. What would I do? You know, those are all the things that your body would do if a lion just started coming up and growling at you. And that's how I like to describe a panic attack is that. You know, all of those things start to happen and people may look at you and go, well, what's going on? There's, there's nothing happening. Well, they can't, they're not experiencing or sensing what you're sensing. And um, yeah, I, I suffer from panic attacks. It's actually a pretty common thing. And, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple things. Some of those things that I mentioned before 
uh, can help cope with those. Um, but I suffer generally from anxiety, from high anxiety. So there's kind of just high anxiety when you're just kind of constantly on alert or your, you know, your, your body tends to tense up really easily. Um, and so I also suffer from that. So there's dealing with the general high anxiety and there's like life skills that can help you do that. Um, you know, not taking on too much or too little, um, there's just lots of things that that could help you manage the life anxiety. And there's like lots of literature and lots of books. So I won't try to solve that because I'm not an expert, but like there are lots of mental health experts that can help you with the life anxiety as well as the clinical anxiety. Now, the clinical anxiety is when it gets to a point where it interrupts your ability to live. It interrupts your ability to function. Um, interrupts your ability to, to maybe keep a job for a certain amount of time. There are certain situations that you run into um, that just make it hard for you to continue in doing what you want to do and enjoying it. Um, and so that that that's the clinical part where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I think it's best to have someone that's an expert that's helping you, whether it's a therapist, whether it's, you know, in, in EA, what are they, EAP, uh, these programs that you're, um, if you're, if you're working and you, you're at a corporation, sometimes they have these where they let you see a therapist for a certain amount of sessions for free. Um, there is, um, National Association of Mental Health, Mental Illness, I believe. And there are some, um, really, really good resources that NAMI has. You can go to NAMI. You can Google panic attacks, you can Google uh, bipolar, you can Google pretty much anything within NAMI. And you can also co connect with uh, support groups that are available through NAMI, uh, peer, uh, peer counselors. These are just people just like you. They're not mental health experts. Maybe you don't want to go to that level, but there's like any level of involvement that you want to have, it exists. If you just want to have a friend to talk to, it exists. If you want to just have a peer counselor, it exists. If you want to just have a therapist, it exists. If you want to have a therapist and a psychiatrist, it exists. If you want to do like certain therapies that have been known to work on for people with trauma, like EMDR, um, I've done similar therapy, very, very effective for me. You replay, you know, you actually access your long-term memory as well as your short-term memory and you store and re- you almost like rejigger the way that your memories were organized and um, very, very powerful. I remember at my last session before I left California, I was just crying, but it was not like a sad cry. It was like a release of this burden that I have had for many, so many years. And um, again, it was just like this, the small me, the nine-year-old me and the middle-aged me and the now me you know, we're back together again and we're separated. Thank you for sharing Nami as a resource. Like for those who are listening, please, if you feel you're suffering, look it up online. As Bakari mentioned, there are resources. And of course, ask for help. Like tell a friend, tell a, mm -hmm. someone that, you know, tell a coworker that you trust that, hey, I think I need help. Do you know anything? Like ask people, and hopefully you, you get the help you need um, immediately. Can I can I add one more thing? Really please, quickly? please, please, please. As we're on this subject, um, there are hotlines that you can call into. Uh, Nami actually has a warm line, but it's basically like if you maybe are struggling with the idea of suicide, but you're not, you're not like. You're not at the point where you're ready to take your life, but you're, you, you're concerned. That's like, you can talk to someone when you're in that situation. So again, the, any, any level of engagement that you want to have, it exists in this world. Um, it has been placed here or someone has created it or God has put it on someone's heart to create it. However you want to say it. Um, but it exists. It's here. And there's always help and there's always hope. So I wanted to just add that 
Um, of course, there are suicide lines. I'm sure that uh, Ali will be all over that in sharing those resources. But yeah. we want to make sure that um, people know that uh, you should definitely, if you're feeling in a bad, bad, bad spot, reach out. Please just ask for help. Uh, you also mentioned your story with um, uh, the police uh, or the law enforcement experience you had. Um, it's one of those things that for me personally, it's always been like such a deep pain that I've seen and like hearing it uh, over and over from my friends and my dear friends like yourself. Like it's just a wound that never probably is going to close and it's it's very painful to see that happening generationally and hopefully as we develop uh, mechanisms both socially and also like within us as human beings hopefully things um, are going to go to a place where in few years from now you and I we can sit again and this issue is resolved and uh, I do want to say that I am hopeful that it will change and that it is changing but I think, and I'm going to wax here philosophical a la Malcolm X, um, (laughs) the reason it hasn't changed so fast is because when you have a thing like racism that is so pervasive, that pervades every part of our lives, because racism is an attitude. Well, it starts with an attitude, and it starts with a hatred for or a disdain for another person. And that attitude, even if your kid or your cousin doesn't share that attitude, you having that attitude affects how they look at that person, especially if they don't know anyone that looks like that, or they've never seen anyone that's a lawyer or a doctor or a this or a that, or, you know, so, you, you know, you start to develop biases. And these things are, they're so hard to root out. And I think just progress has been slow. And yes, there's been political, um, our political system hasn't been friendly, hasn't been an ally to change. For lack of a better word, I know this is the (laughs) the name of the podcast, (laughs) hasn't been an ally to change, but it it was the right word for the situation. But I do believe that, you know, it's been slow but I really like when I look at my kids, it gives me so much hope that this is going to be the generation that really, if not solves it, but like makes the turns of the corner and really helps with that process of at least recognizing. Because if you first you have to recognize the wound, mm-hmm. two sides mm-hmm. or three sides or four sides, however many sides there are, you got to recognize the wound or the wounds. And then once you recognize there's a wound, then you have to de- you have a decision to make. Okay, am I going to let that wound fester, or am I going to do something to heal it? Mm-hmm. So, but I think I think just watching my my children uh, gives me a lot of hope that they're going to stand on the shoulders of the giants that I like that I mentioned, like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, but also just every person that's like ever been kind to someone else, or that's marched, or that's called someone when they thought they were concerned because of a racial injustice. Um, Those things all make a difference. They may seem small, but they add up. And I think in the sum total of the universe, the arc bends towards justice. This is my little Barack Obama-ism. Even with all the uh, wound that you experienced yourself, like the fact that you can uh, analyze the situation and see different aspects of it, it's just fascinating for me to see and hear. So hats off to you. And again, the community behind you. Uh, it's it's also like interesting you, you mentioned, and I'm, not, I'm nowhere to be called like a racism social expert. I, I can't. I, that, that's not what I studied for. But I see the paradigm that you, as you were talking, the paradigm of in this show we are talking about mental health as something that first we should recognize it. We should recognize a wound, 
in someone who is dealing with a mental health issue. And in a way, like the way that you're speaking about uh, racism behavior is it's like also like it's a rooted behavior. Like we should first help folks who are dealing with that issue, really recognizing the fact and the, the root causes of acting the way they are acting and then help them heal through that process. So that's why, again, that communal commitment is required mm-hmm. for everyone to see that problem yep. and to accept the fact that it's a rooted problem. And hopefully through this communal support and commitment, we help each other, to your point, two sides, three sides, four sides, however many sides there is, let's all work together to have that commitment and push each other to solve it. Thank you so much uh, for not only sharing your story, but also like providing a ton of great resources for folks to uh, have those in notes in case if they ever need it or if somebody needs it. We always ask our guests to uh, share an activity that is helpful for mental health uh, that they do usually. And they want to do that with our audiences. So if, if there's an activity that you would recommend to, to the audience to do it for a month, uh, potentially with you, what would that be? Hmm. And if you want to add any details to it, feel free to take this time. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm going to do one of my go-to uh, coping strategies, which is is box breathing. And... Um, I think I, I think I explained it earlier, but I'll, I'll go over it again. So for box breathing, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are in a space where your body can relax. And we're just going to do a round here. So we're going to breathe in. And as we breathe in, we're going to count uh, up to five. And when you get to five, you know, you should stop breathing. Stop breathing in and hold your breath. Okay, so let's go. One, two, three, four, five. And you hold. You count to five again. One, two, three, four, five. And then you breathe out. One, two, three, four, five. And then you hold. One. Two, three, four, five. And breathe in. One, two, three, four, five. And hold. And we're done. Okay, so, I mean, that's essentially, you can keep going around and around and around. But I, sometimes I'll do that. I'll be in a meeting and I'll be breathing or I'll be doing what's called progressive muscle relaxation. So you're doing that, but you're clenching certain muscle groups and then letting them go. And then clenching certain muscle groups and then letting them go. I'll be doing that in a meeting and they won't even know that I'm doing it. <laughs> but it's like I'm I'm coping with my stress as I go, coping with my anxiety as I go through the day. Uh, I, I recently started like doing more of the physiological side and cyclic side. And it's been amazing. This this approach that you suggested for us to do with you for 30 days, um, it reminded me of that and the, in, the after effect of it as, as we were practicing it here. The after effect of it was mm-hmm. very similar. So thank you for bringing that. Uh, we'll be posting that as a campaign so everyone can join you uh, if they want to participate in this very simple box breathing, but very impactful uh, experiment to do yes. for a few days and see what it does to your health and your stress level and everything. We are over time, but any any closing thoughts, anything else that you want to say before we end this call? And hopefully we can have you later for more conversations. Yeah, that would be great. I'm just, um, again, uh, thankful for you uh, having me here and uh, being able to talk about these really Im- important topics. And, um, you know, uh, the, at the time of recording this holiday, we call Thanksgiving. I know no, there's some problematic things with Thanksgiving, but what I want to say is um, this is a good time. And th- there's a lot of research behind this, but this is a good time to find 
something or some things to think about that you're thankful. And the more you do that, it actually improves your mental health to focus on what you're thankful for versus, you know, what we are grieved by. And that's real. We have to deal with that. But if we don't do the thankful thing as well, it's we're out of balance. So I would just I'll just leave you with that. And I know I'm dropping gems here, but there's a little. It's that time of the year, end of the year, almost like we we only have another month. And it's a, it's a good time to reflect of one of the, one of the habits that I, I recently started a newsletter that I'm sending to people who like to receive them. And one of the habits is really celebrating good moments and simple milestones and be, being thankful for what we have achieved even um, in simple activities. So today I'm thankful for the fact that I was able to have you on the show, seriously, and I'm really thankful for what you shared with us. And uh, hopefully this is going to help not only myself, which I know it already helps me having this conversation, but also like hopefully help all other listeners and they benefit from it. And I'm thankful for everyone else who is supporting this show. Thank you so much for coming, Bakari. And hopefully we can have another one of these calls with you later. Thank you too. See you later. That was our conversation with Bakari. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as well. Again, as a reminder, to help this show, the best way is to follow us on all podcast platforms and YouTube. You can also review us up to a five-star review in Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That would help the show to be seen by those who are in the need of it. Also, to join the accountability campaign for this episode, feel free to check the show notes and use the link to sign up to join Bakari for Box Breathing. Thanks again and see you on the next episode of The Ally Show.